Let me welcome to the show political contributor, serious XM political analyst. You've seen her on the Clay Kane show and heard her a lot. Let me welcome Miss Amisha Clark- Cross. Amisha Cross, welcome. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Karen. Yes. And let me welcome in. She is senior policy analyst for higher education at the Education Trust, lead researcher on a study. We're going to talk about when Black women student debt. Let me welcome the great Brittany Williams. Hi. Hello. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming in. Now, feel free if you want to comment on Tim Scott's uh, singleness, because, you know, that means he's eligible. All right. I, I won't. I won't involve you. I won't involve you. Um, 45 million Americans collectively owe 1.7 trillion in student debt, student loan debt that has been from Bernie Sanders. Everyone's saying just cancel the debt, cancel the debt, cancel the debt. And now the study comes out that you guys spearheaded that women hold nearly two thirds of that debt. And as we dig down into the numbers, it's black women. Let me start with Brittany, since you were the lead researcher. Um, When you discovered this, what were your thoughts and how should we be perceiving these numbers? Um, I want to give some quick context uh, or background um, to this. Um, the Education Trust published a report recently on the experiences of Black borrowers. And so the researcher, the lead researcher there was Dr. Jaleel uh, Mustaf and um, Victoria Jackson and um, Oh my goodness, Dr. Jonathan Davis. They did great work around this topic and um, it would not be fair to call me the lead here, but definitely a co and support on this black woman piece with Victoria Jackson. Victoria Jackson. And um, after the report came out and there was so much information that we knew we still wanted to highlight in on this topic. Um, when Victoria and I and the team began to think about what other pullout pieces, what other highlight pieces we wanted to um, deliver messages for, it was a no brainer to do a black woman piece um, because uh, both Victoria and I, the co-authors are black women and we both have our own particular experiences with um, student debt. and so. Um, drilling down the numbers and and um, thinking through the process for us, it was a for sure topic that just needed to be highlighted. So, of the one point seven trillion dollars, uh, Amisha Cross, and and I said before you came in, w- th- this stat has always been kind of circulating that Black women hold the most degrees of anybody in the country. So when I saw this, I was like, of course they would probably also hold the most student debt. What are the actual numbers? What's the range of money that is owed? So we, we have to be real here just to, to level set, I think, um, because Black women enter college at rates that are higher now than we've ever seen historically. With that being said, a lot of that push is largely because of the fact that um, for a living wage job, a job that provides benefits, a job that will help you take care of your family, you need to have a college degree at, at baseline minimum. So we see Black women, um, you, you know, really, really going for this. But what we also see is that um, a lot of Black women, Black men as well, they don't come from family backgrounds where their families are able to contribute in the same way that whites are to their college education. And not just the college education, but also to expenses while you're on the college campuses. The expectation for many Black students going in is that they are actually working towards and sending money back home, whereas that's not really happening for students outside of our community. So you're already coming in with less money and you're sending money back to family. You're working sometimes multiple jobs. There's a lot of burden associated with this, in addition to the fact that these are people who come from uh, modest means when they are entering college. So um, just that point of level set. With that being said, the average cost for for Black women attending college is upwards of $60,000. Now, great, there's going to be some variances depending on whether you go to an in-state school or an out-of-state school and things like that. But just off the top, that is what, what it's going to look like. So for students who are, you know, uh, the average college completion rate is at five years, sometimes six. Most students that regardless of race don't graduate in four. So as as, as college tuition continues to increase, so does the burden specifically on Black women because your parents' funds don't increase no matter how long you stay in college. So we're looking at people who are graduating with 60, 70K plus debt, and many of whom have also taken out more debt 
to be able to afford basic necessities like transportation, like food costs, like ensuring that they actually even have money for, for certain books. And I think that those are things that we don't necessarily always think about or take into consideration when we're talking about the entire cost of the college experience. So what's the number? <laughs> what's the 1.7 trillion collective debt, which I think, you know, President Biden can and should forgive. Now, I know that that would mean that the government would have to make it up. But y'all just printed a whole bunch of money during a pandemic, print more money and make it up or cut the military uh, budget because everything is in cyberspace now. We don't need all of these weapons. We could just hit buttons and stuff. What What are your thoughts on that, Brittany? And, and what is that that? number for black women in particular how big is the burden um outside of the the two-thirds of that 1.7 trillion um the exact number is escaping me right now but we can circle back to it but the way that the education trust feels about it is we support um our administration canceling up to fifty thousand dollars in student debt for borrowers that's fair i think that's fair all right. I know um, Amisha has a master's. Uh, so she went on and probably, I don't, I don't know. Did you, did you incur, did you have like debt or did you get a bunch of scholarships? We just had a young lady on on Monday that had like $1.9 million in scholarships. Um, I, I wish I was that person. Um, I graduated high school valedictorian um, out, of, out of a high school in Mississippi. I applied for colleges. My expected family contribution was zero. Um, that's the contribution that is given after FAFSA has taken into account your parents' taxes and the finances of your family. I graduated high school with an incarcerated mom and I came from a single parent household. I adopted my three younger siblings. So going into college, my wow. finances personally were absolutely nothing. Um, and I ended up maxing out in my federal student loans in addition to being um, a Pell Grant recipient, in addition to getting institutional funding on scholarship, none of it fully covered my college tuition. So um, just, just being honest there, just because of the background I came from, there was no extra monies for anything. And even though the expected family contribution was zero, that still meant that I was going to have to take out a heavy burden from Sally Mae as well. There are very few institutions that even for on academic means provide full rides or close to full rides for students. So I think that we, we have to be very clear to our audience on that because as somebody who grew up with a mom who didn't go to college, but emphasized college so hard for all of her kids, um, I, I think that the idea was that if you work hard, if you get all A's, if you, you, know, you strike out in that sense, that it's going to be easier for you financially to get through the process. And quite frankly, that was simply not the case. And then you went on to get a master's. So that's Absolutely. more debt. Absolutely. You know, we, I, graduated we, we, in 2000, I graduated in 2009, right after the 08 recession. There weren't too many jobs available for anyone who was graduating during that time. So if the option was either pick a job or go to a job that's going to pay you the same as you would get without having a college degree or to go back to school and level out the chances, I decided to go back. Woo. And, and, you know, you think about, you know, that the choice that you made, but it's now more debt and, you know, Barack Obama had student loan debt when he was running for president. Stacey Abrams had debt, you know, student debt when she was running for governor. And these were people in their 40s. Right. And you think, you know, you've worked uh, 15 plus years of your life after college and you still got student loan debt. I know uh, Sina Gaznavi had three hundred thousand. He went to law school. Three hundred sixty thousand dollars in debt from all of the law, you know, it's a lot and it's burdensome because it's hard to see how you're going to dig your way out. And it's the federal government for the most part. So Brittany, you know, you, you said you did the study and it was personal for you, you too. Uh, do you still have student loan debt? I do still have student loan debt and I'm currently pursuing a doctoral degree. And so um, when we talk about in the piece, black women uh, pursuing degrees for upward mobility, that was the conversation for me and my family, uh, similar to Amisha coming from a low wealth community, raised in a single parent home where my mother did not have a college degree, but absolutely encouraged me. I'm the oldest sibling of four. And so she encouraged me and I also wanted to be that example you know, for my, my family, um, but we did not have conversations around funding my college degree. And so without proper guidance, student loans were, were my option. Um, mm. Along with Pell Grant, I, I was a zero EFC student as well. And so I received full Pell Grant, um, but tuition fees, staying on campus, those costs 
added up tremendously, um, as well as sending money back home <laughs> to my siblings and, and being able to support myself um, while I attended college full time away from home. Um, student loans were my option. And, you know, even now in my doctoral program, it is not a fully funded doctoral program. Um, and so some of that tuition cost is being paid by uh, student loans, even still. Wow. Uh, she's going to be Dr. Brittany Williams. I'm just going to make it easy. So we'll Thank just get you. used to it. Dr. Brittany Williams is here. <laughs> Amisha Cross is here. You know, as every day, I'm like constantly thinking about ways that we can shift the conversation within ourselves. And we have, I feel like we've been fed a bill of goods that is not necessarily valid anymore. That if you just do right, go to school, get good grades, get you go to get your degree, everything's going to be fine. They don't tell us the real game. As we talked about Elon Musk being the richest man in the world. I don't know if he can read, but it doesn't matter. Right. Because, you know, he's in a different he's in the stock market where his stock, you know, his company and his bill. We're not teaching kids how to do that. Right. We're teaching them to go to school, get the degree, get out, get the safe job. And even the job market is not safe anymore. It, should we start to change the narrative around the value of an education? And I, I don't want to diminish it. I think we should all be very literate. I think we should read and write and do all the great things. But should we change the narrative for our young people going to school? The, the, the streets are talking. I think the streets are changing the narrative in and of themselves. There are people who graduate every single day who are still stuck in a rut in terms of trying to find employment that will be able to satisfy not only their student loan burden, but also to keep a roof over their heads. And we have to be very honest about that, particularly in the Black community. Part of what this report points out is just how strong the grievance is between uh, Black women who have multiple degrees versus uh, white men who have no degree at all or even versus Black men um, when it comes to how much Black women are earning. The competitiveness isn't determined by our education as much as it is um, strictly determined in many cases by the cross-section of our gender and our race. And that's something we can't educate ourselves out of. I am so excited that there are Black women who are pursuing higher education degrees and going beyond higher education degrees. We're the most degreed uh, population of women in this entire country. But when it comes to the dollars and cents, we don't have very much to show for that. So I think that we have to level set with, with future generations and with young people right now that until we're able to jump through this Jim Crow economic system, then it's mm -hmm. going to be extremely burdensome to see the, the, see the buy-in for what we actually put in as it relates to our, our fight and our, and our push for higher education. I'm someone who fully supports higher ed, but I am also someone who recognizes that for many people who look like me, the cost-benefit analysis of it becomes very, very difficult. We need to have that conversation on loop, Amisha. And Brittany is shaking her head. Yes, you know, as you pursue your doctorate. But now I think you're doing it with, uh, you have a specific goal in mind. Uh, I feel like a lot of our, and I talk to kids all the time because I teach. They go in because they were supposed to, because their parents said, you got to go to college, you got to get a degree with no clue about what, why am I here? Half the time they got these majors, they don't like the stuff, then they change their majors. I have a kid in my class right now go, who's on the medical school track, but he really wants to be a writer because his parents like, you got to go to medical school and be a doctor. So he's doing it. But, you know, and he's going to be OK, quite frankly, you know, he's going to be a doctor. He's going to be all right. But it is it's difficult um, when I think it's a lie, just like the fairy tales and Cinderella. Like we need to blow up all of that. Um before before I let you guys go, Katanji Brown Jackson made history today. Uh, as Black women, I, I think it's super important. Representation does matter in this country. And I just want your, your views, even though she wasn't unanimously selected or confirmed, which should have happened being the most degreed, the most accomplished person probably in the history of the Supreme Court. Brittany, how do you feel as you as you're, you're a mom, you know, to see this woman, uh, all four foot 11 of her <laughs> strong, powerful self about to swear in? Uh, to become a Supreme Court justice, the first Black woman. Today was an amazing day for Black women. And I think that I, I agree and I can share, I, I agree with you that it should have been unanimous. Um, I can share that 
throughout the confirmation hearings, I have had so many different emotions, um, but I think this absolutely speaks to that Black woman experience, and it absolutely speaks to how we can get the degrees, but the equitable pay, the equitable wage, the equitable treatment is not there. And even as something as so big as SCOTUS, we can even see those same stories being replicated in her um, experiences there. And so I think that um, today was amazing. It's, it was amazing to, to really sit back and be a part of this history, her story. Um, and I think that it is uh, very late in the game, but we're here and I am excited about it. Amen. Amisha, where were, where were you when the vote came in? Um, I was I was actually on another call with Brittany, but I, I think that while I was watching the the, the numbers come down, um, one of the things that kept resonating with me was something that Katanji Brown Jackson said early on in the confirmation process about how when she decided she was going to apply to Harvard for undergrad, she had a counselor who told her that she might need to set her sights a little bit lower. Um, when I think about that as a, as a black woman and that this is a woman who was at the top of her class, she had the highest test scores. Last time I checked, Harvard isn't just letting anybody in, but you had a counselor who's supposed to believe in you and guide you along that pathway, tell you as a black woman that you don't need to do this because you're setting your sights too high. Now she is going to sit as the first black woman on the Supreme Court. And I think that this is a beautiful moment. It wasn't one that was without a lot of haranguing. All of us watched the um, all of us watched the Senate confirmation hearings. We heard the Republicans try to spew all types of things against her, basically claiming that she um, that she supported child molesters and child um, and child sex crime acts and things like that. We watched them try to diminish her character, try to say that she only got her higher ed degrees from the top institutions in the country because of affirmative action. Every way they could, they tried to nullify this woman and her experience and make her a, a cherry pick candidate. And she fought hard, she stayed strong, and she did as she told us all to do, persevere. So I, I, today is a happy day for me. I think it's a happy day for Black women. It's a happy day for Black youth. It's a happy day for America because it mm -hmm. shows that we are charting a very special course.